This video is sponsored by Blinkist. Check it out via the link in the description. The Tsar of Russia is dead. Murdered by the Narodniks, radical socialist terrorists. Today, we view terrorism as an act of intimidation. But that's not how the Narodniks saw it. They believed in the propaganda of the deed. To them, terrorism was an act of inspiration. They believed that a single great deed could inspire the people to rise up and overthrow their oppressors. But that's not what happened. Instead, the oppressors cracked down. Among those executed for his part in the assassination was Alexander Ulanov. Like so many revolutionaries before, he threw his life away for nothing. Nothing except to make clear to his brother, a fellow revolutionary, that Narodnik terrorism wasn't working. That a new strategy was needed to bring socialism to Russia. A Marxist strategy. His name was Vladimir Lenin. On March 1st, 1898, while Lenin was trapped in Siberian exile, a secret meeting of Russian Marxists was held in Minsk. Its nine attendees were the key leaders of the Russian Democratic Socialist Movement. This meeting was only possible with the assistance and resources of the Bund, perhaps the largest socialist organization in Eastern Europe, although it wasn't a political party so much as a Jewish labor union. In any case, this meeting founded what would soon be called the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party, or RSDLP. Soon, a young Vladimir Lenin would join this party, found its Bolshevik faction, and lead them to victory with the most politically successful ideology in history, Marxism-Leninism. So you can call me Ezekiel. And this is the history of the Bolsheviks. But first, before we abolish capitalism, let's participate in it. Because this video is sponsored by Blinkist. 2023 is the year for you to become the person you always wanted to be. And Blinkist is here to help. Blinkist summarizes all of the key ideas from their library of over 5,500 nonfiction books and podcasts in just 15 minutes. Allowing you to improve yourself without interrupting your busy schedule. Blinkist's massive library covers 27 different categories of topics. And, since Blinkist is audio, you can listen to it while you exercise, commute, or even when you just want to relax. Their catalog even includes books we've covered on this channel. So if you've always wanted to know more about Karl von Clausewitz's On War, Sun Tzu's The Art of War, or Alexander Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago, but don't have the time to read them yourself, let Blinkist do all of the hard work for you while you go on living your life. And now, Blinkist is introducing their newest feature, Blinkist Connect. Blinkist Connect allows every premium plan to be shared between two different accounts at no additional cost. And, while the accounts are kept totally separate, you can share your favorite summaries with the linked account, helping to share valuable knowledge with your friends. So click the link in the description to start your 7-day free trial, get 25% off Blinkist Premium, and enjoy two memberships for the price of one. Doing so goes a long way to supporting this channel. And now, back to the video. From his exile, Lenin closely followed this new party, and concluded that if it were to succeed, it would need its own paper. So when his exile ended, Lenin traveled around Russia to discuss the idea with fellow Marxists, and then traveled to Switzerland to start his new paper, calling it Iskra. Iskra opened with a blistering attack, not against capitalism, but against other socialists. It insisted that unity among socialists was meaningless without ideological agreement. As such, the paper would not be a general socialist publication, but an explicitly Marxist one. The paper wasn't really meant for the socialist intellectuals anyway, but for the workers themselves. Naturally, the paper was illegal in Russia, so it had to be smuggled in or printed underground, but it was so popular that they were never able to meet demand. Eventually, the party grew large enough to justify holding its second congress in July of 1903, first in Brussels and later in London to avoid the police. This conference revealed that the party was very young. Most delegates were under 30, while Lenin was considered old for being 33. At this congress, it was established that the party should be a centralized democratic institution. This was in opposition to the Bund, who preferred a federal structure along national lines. But the Bund itself was a centralized organization, so everyone thought that they were being hypocrites and ignored them. This congress was also when the seeds of the Bolshevik-Menshevik split were first planted. It was all over this question. Who is a member of the party? You see, Lenin wanted the definition to be, a member of the RSDLP is one who accepts its program and supports the party both financially and by personal participation in one of the party organizations. Lenin's opponent, Martov, wanted this change to anyone who, 
quote, gives the party his regular personal cooperation under the direction of one of the party organizations. These two definitions mean pretty much the same thing. So you're probably wondering, why would anyone split over it? Well, that's not the real reason they split. This fight was a symptom of the two underlying and competing trends within the party. Lenin's definition was stricter, more hardline. Martov's was looser, more conciliatory. The hardliners would soon become the Bolsheviks, while the softliners were the Mensheviks. In fact, while the most common translations for Bolshevik and Menshevik are majority and minority, they could also be translated to mean hards and softs, which better reflects the nature of the split. At first, Lenin seemed to have the majority with 33 votes, but several members of his Iskra group defected to Martov's side, causing him to lose the vote 28 to 23. But Lenin's misfortunes didn't stop there. The Mensheviks were now out for blood. Martov managed to convince key members of Iskra's board to defect to their cause, removing the Bolsheviks from controlling positions in the paper and turning it into a solidly Menshevik rag. When it was all over, the RSDLP was in firm Menshevik control. But the Mensheviks didn't even stop there. They badmouthed the Bolsheviks to leftists around the world, turning them into pariahs among the international left. It's worth mentioning that Leon Trotsky was at this conference too, but far from being the great Bolshevik leader we know him as today, he thoroughly sided with the Mensheviks, largely for the sake of party unity. Back in Russia, there was another major assassination, killing the Russian interior minister Viktor Plev. The regime reacted by offering concessions to the liberals, including allowing them to hold their own congress. Now in control of the RSDLP, the Mensheviks pushed their moderate agenda by trying to collaborate with the liberals and attend their congress. This infuriated the Bolsheviks, who hated the idea of class collaboration. Interestingly, Trotsky took up the Bolshevik position here, writing articles about it in Iskra. But all that won him was a swift removal from the Menshevik faction. But the Bolsheviks wouldn't be on the back foot for long. They were reinvigorated with new exiles from Russia, and managed to raise enough funds to start a new paper to replace their lost Iskra, the first issue of which was published on December 22, 1904. Four weeks later, Russia was in revolution. In 1904, tensions between Japan and Russia over control of Manchuria exploded when the Japanese launched a surprise attack against the Russian fleet at Port Arthur, thus beginning the Russo-Japanese War. This war would be nothing but one humiliating Russian defeat after another. This outraged the Russian people, who began to openly protest their government. The leader of this nascent Russian revolution was an Orthodox priest named Father Gapon. He was not a radical socialist, and only wanted to work with the Tsar to create better conditions for the Russian people. In fact, when agents from the RSDLP tried to radicalize Gapon's movement, they were met with skepticism, hostility, and even violence. Gapon himself told them, do not introduce discord. Let us march towards our sacred goal under a single, peaceful banner, common to one and all. The truth is that neither faction of the RSDLP was prepared for this revolution. The Bolsheviks were busy dealing with their own internal split, while the Mensheviks had few agitators on the ground. Neither faction had done any of the work to reach out to Russia's workers, so it was only natural that they'd prefer Father Gapon, who they all knew and trusted. But that was about to change. On Sunday, January 9th, Father Gapon led a procession to the Winter Palace hoping to present a petition to the Tsar. The RSDLP, in spite of their skepticism, decided to participate, only to quite literally be told to march at the back of the line. While intended as an insult, it turned out to be a tremendous stroke of luck for the Marxists. Gapon did everything he could to make his peaceful intentions clear. He banned red banners from the procession, and wrote a letter to the interior minister explaining his plans. But that didn't stop the government from entering a state of total panic. So on that fateful Sunday, 140,000 people gathered outside the Winter Palace to petition their emperor. Many carried religious icons and wore their best clothing. In response, the emperor's soldiers opened fire. At least 4,600 people were killed or wounded, but few of them were members of the RSDLP, who, remember, were safe at the back of the crowd. This radicalized both Gapon and his followers more than the Bolsheviks could have hoped for. Gapon openly denounced the Tsar, as his followers became increasingly violent. But the RSDLP still couldn't take advantage of this. They were too small, too underfunded, and too poorly led. 
In fact, none of the Bolsheviks leaders were even in Russia yet. The Menshevik Martov only arrived in October, while Lenin arrived in November. At least Trotsky was there by February. Rather than try to accomplish anything, the RSDLP returned to their usual infighting. The Bolsheviks tried to hold a party congress, which the Mensheviks resisted, prompting the Bolsheviks to unilaterally hold their own conference in London. The Bolsheviks invited the Mensheviks to attend, but naturally the Mensheviks turned it down and held their own conference in Geneva. At the Bolshevik conference, they established Bolshevism's beliefs, tactics, and plans, solidifying Bolshevism as an ideology and not just a faction. Eventually, the Russo-Japanese War ended and the creation of the Duma was announced. As one liberal figure put it, the Japanese will not enter the Kremlin, but the Russians will. The Duma's voting system was designed to massively overrepresent the landowners, bourgeoisie, rich peasants, and the urban middle class. The RSDLP, social revolutionary allies, and even some radical liberals all agreed to boycott it. Meanwhile, Trotsky worked to set up the Petersburg Soviet. While it was headed by Trotsky, Bolsheviks held key positions on its executive committee. The Soviet was quick to seize the printing presses, introduce an eight-hour workday, put workers in charge of some factories, and even set up its own armed militia. While Lenin loved the new Soviets, the Bolsheviks on the ground hated them. They thought that the Soviets should be under direct RSDLP control, and issued demands to that effect. After those ridiculous demands were rejected, the Bolsheviks resigned from their positions within the Soviets, giving up all of their power and putting it right into the hands of the Mensheviks. But in spite of that mistake, both branches of the RSDLP grew rapidly. Eventually, Moscow became a Bolshevik stronghold, while the Bund and the Mensheviks controlled the empire's west. The readership of the party's papers grew massively, attaining circulations in the tens and even hundreds of thousands. Trotsky's paper, the Ruskaya Gazeta, did the best, with a circulation of half a million by December. Even better, money began to flow into the party's treasury, much of which went towards stockpiling weapons and explosives and organizing small combat units. With such an upsurge in success, both factions became possessed by a desire to reunify the party, a trend which Lenin supported. It was a good thing that the RSDLP was coming back together, because the revolution was intensifying, and an uprising seemed imminent. Beginning on December 7th, over 100,000 workers initiated a general strike in Moscow. In the following days, it grew both in size and in level of violence, but the Moscow Soviet totally failed to take control of the situation. Even when the police cracked down on the strikers, the Soviets still didn't do anything about it. So as clashes continued, the workers remained unorganized. Soon, the workers' militias rose up, but they had few weapons and were unable to get more. On the 9th and 10th, barricades were erected throughout the city, which signaled the beginning of a full-blown Moscow insurgency. But the insurgents had no proper leadership, and Moscow was practically the only Russian city to have a major uprising. With Moscow isolated, it was easy for the government to focus its troops and crush the insurgents. So in spite of the best efforts of the Bolsheviks, Mensheviks, and the rest of the revolutionaries, the uprising was soon put down. The first Russian Revolution was a failure. The following months and years would see an intense crackdown from the Russian government. Revolutionaries of all stripes were arrested, executed, forced underground, or fled abroad. The Russian economy then entered a deep depression, which led to mass unemployment and a general worsening of conditions for the workers. This forced the Bolsheviks and Mensheviks to stop infighting, helping to further heal the rift within the RSDLP. But for nearly a decade, nothing would come of it. Russian autocracy and capitalism seemed invincible. And that's where we'll leave the Bolsheviks, at their lowest point. How will the RSDLP survive a second exile? Will the Bolsheviks and Mensheviks be able to maintain party unity? And will Trotsky ever get off that fence and finally pick a side? Find out all of this and more in part two. Which, when it's out, you'll be able to watch by clicking the link on the top right of your screen. This video was funded by Russian aristocrats with money made from centuries of serfdom and capitalist exploitation, including Josiah, and by this video's sponsor, Blinkist. Links to Blinkist and where you can support us directly are in the description. Like, comment, and subscribe for more. I'll see you in part two.